All right, so this is actually going to be um, the, the presentation I gave for my thesis defense at the end of my master's program at Utah State last year. Um, and the, the reason I want to do this is because I think it's going to be a good sort of overview on pesticides just in general. Um, and then also, like I said in the, the previous video, um, if you're ever interested in sort of grad school, it'll give, give you a little bit of an idea of kind of what the, the overall end, end project at least looks like, the, the kind of way you get there, and obviously exactly what you're doing is going to be different. Um, but you can kind of get a little bit of a sense of sort of what it may look like, uh, especially if it's a, a science field that you're interested in. Um, but then also we talked about in chapter one, sort of sound science and the, the way that we do science, the scientific method. Um, I'm going to explain the, the different experiments and kind of the way I set up my research. So you'll be able to kind of see sort of the, the controls that were put into place to make sure that what I was um, trying to, to measure was actually what I was observing. Um, but just in general, a pesticide is going to be any substance used to control a pest. Um, we've got a whole bunch of different classes of pesticides. So insecticides kill insects, herbicides kill herbs, um, fungicides kill fungi, um, and there's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, and the, the reason we use them is because they have a whole bunch of different benefits. So obviously they, they protect us against those pests, and depending on what that pest is, um, it could give us protection against diseases. So a long time ago, not a long time ago, actually, um, in the, the middle of the, the previous century, um, a chemical known as DDT, so dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethene, um, was sprayed pretty indiscriminately, just sprayed pretty much everywhere. And the, the reason it was uh, sprayed was because it combats um, a couple different diseases, so malaria and typhus. Um, And then uh, other reasons we use it is just because in agriculture, it's going to help us improve, uh, improve the, the crop yield. So we're going to get more, um, just be producing more food if we don't have as many pests sort of uh, killing those plants. Uh, we use it in our, our homes just to, to protect against different insects and things like that from getting in there, things that are going to reduce the, the quality of our, um, our lives. And then in some cases, uh, we're also going to see that's going to be an economic benefit. So with the, the farming agriculture, that's going to increase the, um, the, the crop yield. It's going to give us more food. Ultimately, um, it's going to help reduce the, the price for the, the consumer just because we're going to have more of that supply now. So it's got a benefit for both, um, both parties there. And then we can see some of the, the other benefits just listed here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. If you'd like, you can kind of just pause the video um, and read through them. But you can see controlling pests and plant disease. It's going to help us improve the, the crop yield, um, just help prevent the, the spread of disease within those environments. Um, so things like cattle, um, actually cattle's here, livestock. These are thinking about just more of the, the plants or the disease that are going to kill those crops. Um, but with the, the cattle, we can kind of see the, the same thing, helping prevent um, diseases from being transmitted between the, the different um, livestock as well as humans. And then finally, thinking about just protecting different structures. So sometimes you'll see organisms are going to be destructive to um, different materials that things are made out of. So sometimes they're going to eat wood. So we're going to have to get something that's going to uh, sort of remove that pest if it's going to destroy uh, the, the structure of that house or whatever it may be. Um, and then you can see just the, the secondary benefits that we're going to see from those. Uh, and then with these pesticides, because they do have those benefits, it's not a, a surprise that they're used in such a, um, a large scale. So according to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, uh, a decade ago, over 3 billion kilograms were sprayed globally. Um, and the, the United States was about 20% uh, 20 of it, so about a fifth of it. 600 million kilograms or 0.6 billion kilograms. Um, and then you can see just the, the image here. The, the different types and then just the um, the sort of the the market the economic uh, benefit that these uh, different classes of herbicides have a, um, have related with them. But with these pesticides, um, it's not all good. They do have quite a few negative effects, and those are going to be seen when the 
the pesticides um, get to a, a non-target area. So I'm saying matrices here because that's just referring to the different types of sort of substances. So they could get to be the soil. That's one matrix. The vegetation is just getting to a different type of plant that it wasn't intended for. Um, it could get to the different types of water. So surface water is just lakes or rivers. Groundwater is just the, the water that's actually underneath the, the soil. Um, and then the atmosphere as well. So just the, the air that we breathe. Um, and then with this, what we also see is the, the trans, transport of these can occur locally. So they can move just from, uh, if you think about it, if you're spraying it in one area and then there's a house next door, the people that live in that house may be exposed, uh, exposed just because it's a very close proximity. The, the pesticide isn't gonna have to move very far in order for them to come in contact with it. Um, but we also see is the something known as the grasshopper effect or global distillation. Um, and what this is just going to be is long range transport of these chemicals through the atmosphere. Um, so it won't happen with every pesticide um, and it won't it can actually happen with other chemicals. So it doesn't have to just be pesticides, uh, but it won't happen with every chemical. It's only going to happen with chemicals that are actually going to essentially evaporate. It's known as volatilization but it's just the, the process of moving into the, the gas phase. Um, and what we're gonna see is when you spray a pesticide, if you spray it, let's think about the equator, it's gonna be a hotter environment. If that pesticide then volatilizes, again, just becomes uh, a gas, it's then liable to just move in the atmosphere, get transported, uh, transported around based on the, just the, the regular air movement. And then if it moves up to the, the Northern hemisphere, it's gonna to get to a colder location. It may drop down and just settle there, but then if it gets hot there, so let's say it moves throughout the day, cools down at night, the, the chemical settles back down into the, um, settles out of the, the gas phase, but then the next day it heats up again, we can see the, the chemical move. So what we're just seeing in this, uh, this process is long range atmospheric transport is the, the movement of these chemicals um, to places that are gonna be extremely, extremely far away from where they were ever initially used. Um, and that's why in the, the, the very North Pole, extremely far away from um, where any of these chemicals may have been used, they've uh, actually measured these chemicals in the, the snow, the water, the air. They've measured them in different um, animals that lived in those environments because we're seeing this process occur. Um, so this just, again, goes to emphasize the, the global nature of environmental science. Everything's gonna be interconnected. And what we do in one place is gonna obviously have an impact on that environment, but we can also see it's gonna have an impact just on the, um, the, the global environment as a whole. And then with these pesticides, um, if they kind of just moved around and didn't really cause any negative effects other than to the, the thing it was intended for, it wouldn't really be a big deal. We wouldn't really care. Um, but these do have quite a few um, negative effects. And then the, the first bullet point there, what it's saying, lethal and sublethal effects, um, depending on the, the pesticide, depending on the, the organism, uh, and depending on the, the exposure, so how much of, much of that chemical they're actually exposed to. Um, in some cases, the, the pesticides, pesticide exposure can kill whatever that, that organism is, including humans. Uh, but a lot of the times what we're actually going to see is what's known as sublethal effects. And those are going to be things that are going to sort of impair the behavior, impair the ability of that organism, but it's not actually going to kill it. Um, and one thing they see a lot of the times in insects is um, rather than the, the insect dying, they'll often see that the, the insect kind of starts almost spazzing out. Um, and it's almost kind of having a seizure. And what that's ultimately gonna to lead to is it's not gonna be able to, uh, to go get food. It's not gonna be able to get water. It's not gonna be able to get the, the resources it needs. Uh, and then over time, it's just gonna die that way. Uh, and then with these, uh, I mentioned DDT before because it helps prevent the, the spread of those different diseases so like malaria and typhus. Um, but DDT uh, was, would be the chemical that was responsible for the uh, the book Silent Spring, because what DDT did was it, um, in birds, it kind of just broke down the, the, the shells of their eggs, didn't allow them to, to reproduce. So what they noticed in the, the spring was 
that the, the birds were no longer singing. So that's why the book's called Silent Spring. And that was one of the, the main factors that kind of helped spur it along the environmental movement um, that ultimately led to the, the creation and the establishment of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, but then also chlor, uh, chlorpyrifos. You may have heard of this chemical in the news. Uh, may, prob, maybe not, uh, probably not, I would assume, but you might have. Um, and then this is a chemical I actually used in my, my research. Uh, but this is a chemical that when it's exposed, when you're exposed to it, um, especially children, it's going to uh, result in neurological issues. Um, so that's why it was recently just banned. I think the, the state of California, I know for sure, banned it. Uh, I think that was in 2020, I believe. Uh, but I think the, the EPA, I think, banned it nationally. Um, but I think that's going to be a process where it's slowly phased out rather than just a uh, like a line in the sand, we're done with it right now kind of thing. Um, and then often, um, and also I should mention the, the adverse effects. Um, you may have heard about the, the bees, how we need to save the bees. One of the, the reasons they think that the, the bee population is decreasing and the, the reason the bees are so important is because the, the bees are one of the, the main pollinators. So they're going to be the the main reason a lot of plants um, are able to reproduce because the, the, uh, the bees are kind of moving around, flowing from uh, plant to plant, pollinating them that way. Uh, but the, the bee populations are decreasing. One of the reasons they think is the, the increased use of pesticides. Um, and they have a couple specific pesticides in particular that they have um, more concerns about than others. But they think the, the pesticides are playing a role in the, uh, the bee population decreasing. But with that, I've seen a couple different reasons sort of hypothesized, and I would, I would be very surprised if it wasn't just a combination of a couple different things. I think the pesticides definitely play a role, um, but I think some of the other stuff we cover in class is also uh, contributing. So I think just habitat destruction in general is probably playing a role, um, as well as just climate change and other things um, as well. But pesticides are probably a very big piece of that. Um, and then in order to kind of combat some of those uh, negative consequences, like I said, chlorpyrifos was recently banned in California, and I believe the, the rest of the United States. Um, DDT was eventually banned uh, once they kind of realized the, the health consequences with that. Um, so regulation is one way we kind of try to strike a balance between the, the benefits of uh, pesticides as well as the, the risks that are associated with their use. Um, and the way they do that is they establish different limits on when you can spray a pesticide, where you can spray a pesticide, how much you can spray. Um, but with these regulations, they're often reactionary. So they often don't get established until something goes wrong. And the, the reason for that is because establishing these regulations, determining um, sort of what the, the different thresholds, uh, what the limits for different things need to be, is going to be a very time consuming process. It's going to be a very expensive process. And then it can also be politicized. Um, so the, the EPA, depending on the, the president, is going to be run uh, very differently. And then just over the, the past decade, uh, that was very evident because from Obama to, to Trump to, to Biden, you could really see the, um, the importance that was put on the, the EPA or the lack of importance that was put on the EPA. And um, that was evident in the, the spending as well as sort of the, their priorities and the, the regulations and the, um, the, the decisions that they made in terms of what pesticides were allowed and what pesticides weren't, and then just a whole bunch of other environmental, um, environmental issues as well, not just specifically pesticides. Um, so because that regulation is so expensive, is so time consuming, one way we can kind of try to get around it is with something that's known as environmental fate modeling. And this is essentially just gonna be a simulation of what the, the pesticide's gonna undergo once it's sprayed into the environment. So you can just look at this diagram here, we've got the, the pesticide application, and then that can occur in a couple of different ways. So sometimes the, the pesticides are sprayed from planes. Um, I did a little bit of uh, field work with pesticides where I just used a backpack, a backpack sprayer. So I basically just um, wore it like a backpack and then I had a little um, hose nozzle thing um, that I just sprayed around as I walked. Sometimes there's vehicles that kind of just drive around and spray them out of the sides. Um, so the apl application can look a little bit different, but once that pesticide is applied, um, some of it may not even reach the, the plant. 
So that's going to be what's known as spray drift. And sometimes we may be plant, uh, spraying it to a plant. Sometimes we may be spraying it to soil. Um, but the, the, the pesticide that never even reaches the intended area, that's just spray drift. But then once we reach the, the environment, we've got a, a bunch of different processes. So the, the plant can absorb some of the uh, chemical. It can make its way deeper into the, the soil. It can run off into the, the nearby water, and then it can have a bunch of different processes occur there. Um, volatilization, I already talked about, essentially just evaporation into the air, and then it can move around in the, the atmosphere. If it rains, the, the plant can, or the chemical can be washed off the plant into the soil or into um, surface or groundwater. And then also the, the plants, uh, or the, the chemical, I should say, can just be decomposed, so it can be broken down by sunlight. Um, but all of these factors are going to be dependent on the, the location, it's going to be dependent on the, the chemical, it's going to be dependent on the, the weather as well. Um, and then with this fate modeling, I should say the, the biggest reason we can't really do it, and the, the thing that I focused on in my research, is this photo uh, decomposition or photo degradation component. So that's going to be the, the process where sunlight is breaking down these chemicals. Um, and then in my, my research group, there was already a model that predicted just the, the volatilization component. So it predicted how much of that chemical is going to make its way into the atmosphere. But in order for this model to actually be more applicable, be something that can actually be used uh, in the real world, we don't want to just focus on one thing. We want to focus on as many of these processes as possible. Um, so my work was just focused mostly on the, the photo decomposition or photo degradation. Um, and then combining both of those pieces. Um, but like I said, the, the big issue with the, the modeling is this photo de uh, degradation component. Not, not uh, almost no pesticide has a, had it measured. Um, so we don't actually know how fast or how slow these different pesticides degrade. And the, the reason that's gonna be important is because for the, the very select few pesticides that have had the, the photo degradation measured, the rate at which they degrade is very, very different. Um, so for example, we have these two chemicals. One of them, when it was exposed to light, had half of that substance um, be degraded into something else in just six hours, while the other chemical took 500. So it took much, much longer. So the, the reason this is gonna be important is because now if we spray those two chemicals in the same environment, this first chemical is gonna break down very, very quickly because it's much more reactive. Whereas this chemical is gonna stick around much, much longer, at least based on just this photo degradation. So if we wanna actually make sure that we can model these chemicals properly, we need to make sure that we have this sort of component in the, the modeling aspect. And the, the reason I should have said that we're interested in modeling is so that we can get a better understanding on how these pesticides are behaving in the environment. We can determine which pesticides are the best uh, to spray at a certain time, when's the best time to spray them, just so that we can ultimately spray them more uh, efficiently, more effectively, and just limit their use overall. Ultimately an attempt to maximize the benefits of pesticides while minimizing their uh, minimizing their uh, negative um, consequences. All right. So what my work was focused on is <clears throat> developing a, a model that actually predicted how the, the pesticides behaved in the environment. So I was gonna be adding photo degradation to the model that already existed that predicted uh, volatilization or evaporation essentially. Um, and then I wanted to test that model to see how, just to see how well it worked. Um, and then I was going to use it just to look at a couple different questions. Um, and what we ultimately named the, the model was PETL, just because the pesticide dissipation from agricultural land. Um, and then in this sense, dissipation is just going to be anything that removes the, the pesticide from that area. So we're going to spray some amount of pesticide to start. And then I showed that diagram that had all those different processes on it anything that removes that pesticide from that environment or changes it into something else is gonna be factored into this dissipation. Um, but in the model itself, 
it had volatilization to begin with, I wasn't going to be able to add all of those different processes at once because it's going to have to be sort of a, a step by step um, process. So that's why I'm only going to be adding photo degradation. So just how much the, the sun affects these chemicals. Volatilization is just how fast they evaporate. Photo degradation is how much the, the sun breaks them down. And then we're also going to add something called penetration into the leaves. And that's going to be where it actually makes its way inside of the plant. And then you can kind of see the, the general process just with this picture here. So what we're going to be thinking about is the, the pesticide is going to be on this leaf. And then it's going to be able to devolatilize. So it's going to be able to move into the, the gas phase. It's going to have it broken down by the, the sun. Um, and then some of it's also actually going to make its way into the, the leaf itself. Um, and I should say this model is actually just an ex uh, Excel spreadsheet. Um, so it's not going to be a, a simulation in the sense that we're actually going to see sort of an animation showing sort of how this is changing. Um, it's going to be a simulation in the sense that it's going to be a, a series of calculations. And then we're going to be given data that's going to kind of show how that pesticide, how the, how the amount of pesticide is going to change over time. Uh, but we're going to have those three processes. So the, the sunlight can break it down into something else. The, the volatilization can just have it basically evaporate into the air. And then it's going to get moved somewhere else just based on the, the wind. Um, or we can have it just make, it, uh, make its way inside that plant. Okay. And then the, the volatilization. So this is just the evaporation aspect. I'm just going to briefly go over this. So I'm not going to go into the, the like the specific details on any of this, because I just want to keep it general, keep the, the overall idea. Um, but this came from somebody else. So this was somebody else's work. I was involved a little bit at the, the end of it. Um, but one of my advisor's previous students developed a, a model that predicted the, the volatilization, so the evaporation of these chemicals. Um, and then with it, I'm not going to require you to know the, the partition coefficients, but essentially what it is, is it just a, um, it's a way to determine how a chemical is going to, to separate itself between two different things. So if we have like the, the K air water, this is just telling us if we have a chemical, how much of it is going to be in the water versus how much of it's going to be in the air and the same thing, soil air, plant air. Um, so it's just going to be using a, a calculation like this to determine how much of that substance is going to be moving from the, the plant into the air. And then this came from um, somebody else's data, actually. So she, what this student had done was actually just taken the um, equation from somebody else's work. So somebody actually did a whole bunch of research and figured out how these different chemicals, how they moved from the, the plant to the, the air phase. And then they created an equation to essentially just calculate, estimate what that value is going to be for every other chemical. So again, this is probably a little bit confusing, but with this, we're just essentially thinking about the, the calculation on how we're going to figure out how fast this chemical is moving into the, the gas phase. Um, and with it, it's going to be, uh, I should say, this is just how they, they tested that aspect of the model. So they compared it to a whole bunch of actual lab data that other people had done. So the, the model is going to be what the, the model itself actually predicted, how much of that substance evaporated after 24 hours. The, the measured is what the, the data actually said. So somebody actually performed that experiment. And then they just graph those two to compare them. If the, the model was perfect, those two values would always be equal. So everything would be on this dotted line. That's just the, the one to one line. Um, you can see everything's kind of scattered. But if you look, the overall fit is going to be pretty good. Because when we kind of take all of these points collectively, that line of best fit is going to be pretty close to that, that dotted line. So even if you didn't fully understand, um, which you probably didn't just because I didn't go into almost any of the details on how it worked. Um, but just what this is showing is that the, the, the volatilization aspect, so predicting how it evaporates, is pretty accurate just because that line of best fit matches up pretty well with the, the one to one. And we've got a pretty good um, R squared, meaning that the, the line of best fit does a pretty good job of actually representing these points. The, the closer R squared is to one, just the, the better the, the line fits on those points.
And then for the, the photo degradation aspect, the part that I actually did, or the part that I added to the model, I should say, all I did was I looked at the, the data. So I read a whole bunch of research papers, found the ones that were specific to pesticides, specific to, to photo degradation. And then I included that data into the model so that we would actually be able to predict how the, the chemicals breaking down. Um, and then with this, I'm again, not gonna go into too much of the, the details for it, um, but with the, the photo degradation aspect of it, it's gonna be dependent on how much sunlight there actually was. So what I did was I actually linked the, the pedal model, the one that I was making with a, a previous model that just predicts sunlight at different locations. So you can input just a latitude, longitude and elevation. And then for any hour of any day of the year, it just gives you a predicted uh, sunlight value. So I just sort of incorporated that into the, the model. Um, and then just to make sure that the, the sunlight was accurate to those conditions, we kind of had to do a, a little calculation just because essentially what this is doing is determining how fast the, the chemical is gonna break down dependent on the, the conditions at that moment. So if you think about it at the, the middle of the day, when there's more sunlight, when there's stronger sunlight, the, the chemical is gonna break down faster than at the, the middle of the night when it's not gonna break down at all, when it's uh, no sunlight present. So this is essentially just the, the way that we, um, we accounted for the, the changes in sunlight throughout the day. Yeah, I think you can see the, the different, what these represent actually. And then for the, the penetration rate, um, this I'm just gonna skip over, but we just, there was no data on this. So I just made up a, a generic rate that seemed reasonable based on what some other people had sort of hypothesized. Um, but that was just a, a quick sort of rundown on how those three processes work. Volatilization is just the evaporation in the air. That's gonna be dependent on the, the plant. It's gonna be dependent on the, the chemical and the temperature. The hotter it is, the faster it's gonna evaporate. The, the sunlight, or the photo degradation is going to be dependent on the, the chemical and then the, the sunlight, the more sunlight it is, the faster it's going to degrade. And then the, the penetration is just kind of a, um, a generic piece because there wasn't any data on that. So the, the volatilization and photo degradation are specific to that chemical. Penetration is just the, the same for everything, at least in terms of this model. And then similar to the, the previous one, we compared the um, what the, the model predicted for dissipation, so how fast those chemicals uh, left that area, to what was actually measured for a bunch of different um, scenarios. So people actually sprayed pesticide, measured what the, the concentrations were at different times, and then we compared that to what the, the model predicted. And then you can see, again, not a perfect fit, but it is pretty good. Um, does fit it pretty well, so we were pretty happy with those results. Felt like it was a pretty good start to a model that's actually going to be able to, to predict um, predict how pesticides behave after it's sprayed on a, a given crop. Um, and then with this, we just wanted to show also how important it is to include as many processes as possible, because this is the one where it's got volatilization and photodegradation and penetration. But then the, the rest of these, you can see the, the fit gets much worse once we have a different combination of those processes. Um, so the rest of these only have one or two of them. We can see that's not enough to actually predict what's going on very well. Um, so that's why the, the fit of them goes uh, much, much poorly. Um, but with this, I do want to point out one thing. With science, nothing's perfect. So we were happy with this result, but we also wanted to point out kind of where it, it didn't work very well. I want to highlight some of the, the, the issues as well. Um, and again, it's totally fine to do with science because if you look for the most part, this model worked pretty well, but we can see a couple different outliers. So for example, the... Um, I don't remember what these ones were actually. So the, the green square was chlorothalonil. So in this case, the, the green squares here were the only two points that actually use this chemical, chlorothalonil, let's just say specific pesticide. Um, and you can see the, the model was very bad there because these are the furthest points away pretty much from that dotted line. The one that's the, where the model and measured are the exact same. Um, so we can see that there's whatever the, the reason is, I don't know but there's just some issue with that pesticide. So we don't really wanna use this model for that pesticide because for whatever reason, we're just not getting accurate results at all. 
um, with the, the purple example, purple triangle, that was a scenario where there was a whole bunch of wind when the, the pesticide was sprayed. So we think that's a reason why. We think in cases where there's a, a whole bunch of wind initially, we think the, the model just can't kind of um, account for that. And there's a couple of different reasons. Um, but then also with this model, there's no, uh, if you notice, I only added photodegradation and penetration. I didn't add any of those other components. Um, so it's not a, a comprehensive model because there's not other things like wash off. So if there's ever a, an event where it rains, the, the model is not going to be able to account for that. It's not going to be able to account for that rain, taking some of that chemical off the leaves um, and washing it off that way. Um, so it's not perfect, but we were pretty happy with those results. Um, and then we also just use the, the model to answer a couple or examine a couple different questions. So in this case, you can see um, essentially this is just showing as the, the color goes from blue to purple or blue to red, just more of that chemicals being lost. And we can see from March to June, we're gonna be losing more just because we're gonna experience warmer temperatures in June. Um, so that's why we just see more of this area become red or become, um, in this case, like in the, the top or corner, we're coming like that, that bluish green, um, just because we're seeing more of a loss compared to the, the March environment. Because in this case, in June, you're generally gonna have warmer temperatures. We're gonna see that volatilization increase. You're also gonna have stronger sunlight um, so you're going to see the, the photo degradation increase as well. Uh, we did something similar here just to examine how pesticide um, behavior would differ based on location. So you can see Alaska, Minnesota, Utah, Florida, Ecuador, um, just a whole bunch of different locations. And then you can also see it two different times again, so spring versus summer again, um, just to see how location as well as how the um, the, the timing of that sprays differ. Uh, and the, the reason for this, again, because we wanna think about a tool that farmers could actually use to improve their pesticide use. Um, so if they're just using the same pesticide all year round, they're using the, the same amount, they're spraying it, um, they're just kind of using that same routine, they're gonna get different levels of protection at different times of year. So under the, the spring conditions, obviously in Alaska, that's kind of an extreme example, um, but they're gonna have much greater protection in that spring compared to the, the summer, uh, summer spray. And then the other importance for this, um, in this case, we looked at different times of day. So again, we're gonna see different times of day are gonna have different temperatures, different um, levels of sunlight. So that's gonna affect the, the pesticide behavior, how long it can kind of basically stick around before it either uh, evaporates or breaks down from sunlight. Um, and what this is important for is if you look, we do see slight differences. So the different colors just represent the, the different times. Um, this is gonna be important in terms of um, protecting worker safety. So when you spray a pesticide, you're not supposed to re-enter that area for a given amount of time, unless you're wearing certain protection. So uh, PPE, you need certain like respiratory equipment um, and gloves and things like that. So you don't get the, the pesticide on your skin or breathe it in. Because uh, again, they do have those negative uh, consequences. Um, so this could be a tool in terms of actually identifying what those uh, re-entry intervals should be. Because currently they're just sort of a, a generic, uh, like 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever it may be. It's not actually specific to what those conditions are. Um, and depending on where you are, that could be uh, that could be a uh, important factor. And then similarly, we can use this model for um, there's pesticide residue limits on different crops that are gonna be sold at market. Um, we can use the, this model to ensure that those uh, limits aren't being exceeded. So we can make sure that the, uh, rather than having to actually do the, the timely and expensive process of manually measuring all of those different fruits, which obviously we're not gonna, and vegetables, we're not actually gonna have the, the time or ability to do. We can use this to kind of quickly get an idea and then if something seems like it may be a problem, we may be able to just focus on that one rather than uh, have to worry about everything collectively. And then in addition to that, it's just gonna have an important role on making sure that the, the pesticide is effective. Um, and then with this, certain pests are only active at certain times a day. So this could be important because if we spray the, the pesticide in the morning, I don't know why you'd really do it, but if the, the pest isn't only, uh, is only active at night, the, the pesticide itself may no longer be effective by the time that pest actually is in that environment. Um, 
So it can, for a couple different reasons, just hopefully make the, the use of pesticides uh, more efficient and just a, a smarter process overall. And then similarly, um, in terms of protecting workers' safety, there's an aspect of the model that predicts how fast the um, pesticide evaporates into the air. Um, so what this could be do, and we tested it by looking at two um, examples that specifically measure this rate, how fast it volatilizes. That's just known as the, the flux, just the movement essentially. Um, and you can see with the, the prediction, the first one, pretty much right in that range. The, the second one, a little bit on the, the low end. Um, but this could be used to protect worker safety to again, make sure that the, the concentrations in the air isn't gonna be anything that's harmful to those workers. Um, and then for that, you would need to, to link it to another model, um, but that's actually fairly easy to do. Uh, and then finally, just on that, that portion of it, the model works pretty well in terms of predicting pesticide uh, degradation, dissipation, I should say. Um, but there's not a whole lot of data in terms of actually making it applicable, just because not many of those pesticides have had the, the necessary rates actually measured for them. And like I showed at the beginning, the one degraded in only six hours, the other degraded in 500. So having those chemical specific rates is important just because there are going to be that, that wide range of differences. Um, and that led to the, the second portion of my, my research, which is actually measuring some of those rates. And then with that, we sp specified on alfalfa, just because that was the, the, um, the, the grant that gave us money was focused on alfalfa. So that's just what we, we focused on. Um, and the, the reason for that is because there's suspected to be slightly different photodegradation rates. So it may break down a little bit quicker, a little bit slower, depending on exactly what surface it's on. Um, and then we also looked at the active ingredient. So the, the thing that's like killing whatever that pest is um, versus the, the commercial formulation, which is the, the active ingredient mixed along with all the other stuff that's gonna be sprayed. Um, and sometimes that stuff helps the, the pesticide spread out on the leaf. Um, sometimes it helps it prevent from getting evaporated. Um, it can be used for a couple different reasons, but there's always just some other stuff mixed in with that pesticide. Um, and then for that, we use three different pesticides. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details that I may have gone into for the, the actual uh, thesis defense. But if you do have any questions kind of on any of these pieces, just let me know. Um, but these are the three that we focused on. And that's because these three, again, were used on alfalfa. And that's just where we got our money from. Uh, but to do this, uh, we need to have a, a source of sunlight or a source of light. Um, Doing the experiments outside with actual sunlight is going to be difficult just because the, the sunlight is going to be changing. Um, if you think about it, just throughout the day, it's going to be changing uh, just with the, the angle of the sun. But also just if a, a cloud comes at any moment, it's going to change the, the sunlight. Um, so it's not going to be a great environment to do it in that way. You can do it outside with natural sunlight. It's just more difficult. Um, so what we did was purchase a, a solar simulator. And you can kind of see it a little bit here. It's got this box on the, the left hand side. It just opens up. It's got a little sample tray area. And uh, you can actually see the light being produced here. Um, but that's just gonna simulate the, the sunlight uh, that we would have on the, the surface of earth. And the, the big thing about it is it's not perfect. This is the, the spectrum that's actually produced. It doesn't totally match up with the, the sunlight of earth. But the important thing is that it's pretty good at this lower end. Um, and there's no sunlight below uh, 280 degrees in the, the solar simulator, the same thing that's at the, the surface of the earth. Um, so that's the, the main reason why it's sort of an acceptable uh, simulation of that, that natural sunlight. Uh, also because the, the lower end here, these lower wavelengths are gonna be the highest energy. So these are gonna be the ones that are doing most of the degradation. Um, so it's less important that it's as accurate um, at the, the higher wavelengths. And then with this, um, probably seems pretty confusing if you actually stop and just read it not too much, this PNA, pyridine actinometer. An actinometer is essentially just a chemical reaction that's extremely well understood. So you can use that reaction to determine um, the, the light intensity by just doing a, a series of back calculations essentially. So to make sure that the, the light being produced was what we wanted it to be produced and make sure that it was consistent, um, we would use these actinometers in every experiment. So we'd essentially just put little cuvettes with these solutions in. And then at different times, we would just take out those solutions, look to see how much of those substance still remained. And then based on how fast it decreased, we were able to figure out how, uh, how intense that light was. 
Uh, and then with this, uh, like HPLC UV vis, um, that's just one of the, the methods that we use to actually analyze these samples. Again, I'm not gonna go into the details of that, um, but if you do have questions, I'm happy to discuss any of the, the, the specifics of this entire thing. Uh, but to make sure that the, the experiment was set up correctly, um, what we needed to do was first obtain alfalfa leaves, and we would get those from just down the road from where we conducted the research. There was an alfalfa field, um, so I was able to grab them there. And you can kind of see how I would set them up, is I would take the alfalfa leaf and then thread the, the stem of the leaf through a, um, this is just a GC vial. Um, and the reason I did that was because this vial contained water, and that helped keep the, the leaf alive throughout the experiment, otherwise the, the solar simulator. Um, and with the, the leaf no longer being connected to anything, it would just dry out and die. This allowed the, the leaf to stay green throughout the entire experiment. Um, but to make sure that the, the pesticide I was measuring was coming just from the experiment itself, these leaves I obtained, I always measured some of them to just make sure that they didn't have any pesticide just from the field to make sure that they weren't just previously sprayed and that that wouldn't interfere with the, the results I was getting. Um, and then when I set them up in the, the solar simulator itself, um, in addition to the, the ones that would actually get the, the pesticide applied to it, um, I would also just leave one blank in there to make sure that none of the, the pesticide throughout the experiment was kind of moving around from leaf to leaf. So there was a couple different ways um, to make sure that the, the leaves weren't previously contaminated with pesticide. And then this is just explaining how much pesticide I actually put on there. Um, but in addition to that, because we wanted to make sure that the, the loss that we were observing was only due to uh, photodegradation, in addition to the, the blank that just had nothing on it to make sure that nothing was sort of transferring from leaf to leaf, I also had dark controls in the experiment. And those were still placed in the, the solar simulator but then they were covered with aluminum foil so that they weren't actually being exposed to that sunlight. And that way we could observe if any of those dark controls, if they lost any of their, their pesticide, now we would know that that loss isn't due to the, the photodegradation, it's gonna be due to, to some other process, probably evaporation. Um, and then just with this, uh, I'm not gonna go into the extraction, but this is just how we can actually analyze and quantify because there's no way to actually look at these, um, like look at the leaf and just say, okay, there's this much of this pesticide on it. We need to actually go through a pretty extensive process in order to analyze it and get that actual amount. Um, and again, if you want actual questions or specifics on this, just let me know, I'm happy to discuss it, um, but it's not super important in terms of what we're doing here. Uh, but ex extraction is just the, the way that we essentially um, remove just the, the chemical we're interested in rather than all the other stuff that's gonna be in that leaf. Um, and just in that sample, just all that other stuff that's essentially junk um, for what we're looking at. And then in order to quantify it, like I said, we can't just look at it and say, okay, there's this much pesticide. So we extract it and then we quantify it on this uh, GCMS. And this is actually an MSMS because it's got two mass, spe uh, mass spectrometers, excuse me. Um, very interesting. These can me measure very, very precise amounts. Uh, very, very small concentrations. Um, so you may have heard of like parts per million, parts per billion, depending on the, the chemical. Uh, these can quantify parts per billion um, and probably even smaller than that, I would guess probably parts per trillion. Um, so it can measure, if you had one molecule in a, a billion or a trillion of them, it would still be able to detect that one thing. And then with those three chemicals we had, just to quickly go through the, the data, if you look, the, the blue is showing how the, the concentration changed over time, just with respect to the initial one. So one is just the, the concentration we started with, 0.5 would be like half. Um, so you can see with chlorpyrifos, the active ingredient, where it's just chlorpyrifos formulation, when it's the, the, the mixture of the active ingredient and the other stuff it would actually be sprayed with in the field. Um, you can see both of them are decreasing. But you can also see in this case, the orange dot representing that dark control that also decreased. So what this represented is that the, the loss that we saw here wasn't due to photodegradation. This was gonna be due to something else. This was actually due to volatilization. So the, the pesticide actually evaporated just because the, the solar simulator wasn't able to be kept cool enough 
Um, so even with the, uh, the, the examples that were exposed to the light, these weren't leaving because of the, the sunlight. These were leaving because of the, the temperature. And the, the reason we confirm that is because if you look, there's no real difference between the dark control in orange and the one that was actually exposed to sunlight. Uh, but with the, the other two, lambda, salhethrin, cyhalurethrin, and indoxicarb, those we did actually see um, changes. So in this case, it's a little bit of a different type of graph. Um, the blue is representing the formulation. So the ones that's got that other stuff mixed with it, orange, the, just that pure thing. Uh, but we can see in both cases, they're decreasing. And the, the dark control in these were not showing just because the, the dark controls in these stayed pretty much constant. They didn't really decrease at all. So we were able to contribute the loss to actual photo degradation. So the, the light was actually breaking these down. Uh, but what I want to point out here is if you look, there are the error bars here. I didn't mention on the, the chlorpyrifos one. But what we have here is because for each of these examples, each of these time points, so if you look, time is zero, one, two, four, six, and eight. Um, I took a different sample at each of these different time points. So I'd start the experiment and then after an hour, I would take three samples. After two hours, I would take three more. After four, I would take three. Um, and I would take three samples at each of those times. And that's what we're representing with these error bars. The, the point is the, the average of all those data points. And then the, the error bar just represents the, the standard deviation plus or minus um, on each of those. So you can see uh, for chlorpyrifos, the, the standard deviation, not too big. Not perfect, but for this type of experiment with this many sort of different factors, it was pretty good. Um, but with the, the other two, lambda silethrin, especially at the end, gets a little bit uh, large. But the endoxicarb was just extremely, extremely large. So I would just be less confident in these measurements overall, just because if you look, that's an, a, a huge standard deviation there. Um, but then based on that, what we did was we just... Uh, sort of just prove that you could measure these rates. Again, there's not many measured for the, the photodegradation of pesticides, um, but also many of the, the rates for pesticides aren't measured on plant leaves themselves. They're measured on sort of fake surfaces that are just used as an approximate leaf surface, um, which also raises questions on how sort of applicable and how sort of, uh, how well that, that represents a, a real leaf surface. Um, but in addition to this, what we also need to look at if we wanted to make this perfect is figure out what these chemicals are breaking down into. Um, because sometimes what you'll see is the, the product of these reactions is actually going to be more toxic than the original. Um, so sometimes the uh, chlorpyrifos, for one example, it doesn't happen with the, the photodegradation. Um, it doesn't really happen too often, but there is one product of chlorpyrifos, um, chlorpyrifos oxon that's actually more toxic. Um, so if we're, even if we're properly representing the, the, the chemical itself, if we're not representing whatever it's transforming into, we may be missing a, a whole huge piece um, of this sort of environmental importance. And then in addition to that, um, I hadn't had this finished at the, the time I did the, the, uh, my defense, but what we also did was uh, we actually sprayed uh, a field in Utah a couple different times with pesticides. We sprayed lambda silethrin once, we sprayed chlor uh, chlorpyrifos three times, and then took samples of the, the leaves, um, and then just compared the what we actually saw from those leaves compared to what the, the model actually predicted. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, we had collaborators in the at the University of Wyoming. Um, so up in Wyoming, they did two sprays of their own with uh, lambda silethrin. The, the same type of thing, but just so we could now compare different locations as well. Um, and then the, uh, the reason for that is because we wanted to ultimately make a model like this. So you can kind of see the, the decrease in the pesticide being shown just with the, uh, like the, the orange or green or purpley um, line there. But then also what we wanted to put was the toxicity threshold because we also worked with biologists um, uh, worked with biologists to determine the, the toxicity threshold for certain pests as well as certain beneficial insects. Because now the, a farmer could use this to see, okay, if this is the, the pest, the, the pesticide is only effective for 10 hours, 
but also if this is the the pollinator so something like a bee something that you want to introduce to pollinate your field but something that you want to make sure is not being negatively impacted by the pesticide if this is the toxicity threshold you could say okay i want to wait at least 16 hours to introduce those bees so i'm going to wait until at least that second day to introduce them so this is going to be a way that hopefully um, in addition to just getting a better understanding on how long that pesticide's sticking around um, eventually it's going to be a model that's hopefully going to protect beneficial insects like pollinators while also um, giving us a an understanding on how effective it's being against whatever that uh, whatever that pest may be. Um, and like I said, uh, the, the photo degradation is the, the big piece, so they just need to get more of those rates for it to be an actual model that's going to be more widely applicable, something that can actually be used more often um, by more farmers in more situations. Um, and then also we just need to include a few more of those processes. So currently uh, one of the other grad students, she's actually set to graduate pretty soon. Um, she added a few other things to the model. So she actually added some of those toxicity thresholds. She added some of the uh, other factors like wash off. Um, and then that's what you can actually see. Whoops, I added this to the end of the actual presentation. That's what you can actually see here. Um, so this is the, the actual data we got. And then you can see these are gonna be the, the thresholds for um, I can't remember if this is a pollinator or a, a pest, um, but you can kind of just see how this would work. Now the, the farmer would have an understanding, okay, at two days, it's either no longer going to be effective against that pest, or it's going to be okay to introduce the pollinator. And then you can see kind of how that's going to change depending on the, the timing of the spray, what the pesticide is, the location, and things like that. Um, but I also just wanted to point out, again, we talked about science being collaborative in the, the first chapter. Um, so during this project, um, Dr. Hagman was my advisor, um, but these were all these professors were also on my committee, so I worked with them a little bit. These uh, people were in my uh, research group, helped me out with different aspects, uh, did different uh, projects their own that was kind of collaborative, so we always worked together in that respect. Um, these two guys worked in the, the chemistry department and helped me with just different aspects of it because they had different expertise on different instruments and kind of just the, the best way to set things up, uh, especially with research, you kind of have to kind of sometimes make things work the best you can with sort of cheap fixes. Um, so they some, sometimes had good suggestions on how I can make things work like that. And then these were just some of the, the other collaborators that we had for uh, different pieces of those different projects. Because uh, again, science is always gonna be collaborative. It's always gonna be um, something that you're doing together. You're never gonna get anything uh, completely understood on your own. And then even you might have noticed, I call, uh, mentioned a couple of times that we took data just from different research papers. Uh, again, saves everybody time because now we don't have to do those, uh, those experiments ourselves. We can just take that data from those other people. 